Valley entrepreneur and executive to uh, talk with us, Keith Kroc. Keith started his career uh, with General Motors where he became the, the youngest ever vice president and head of the General Motors uh, uh, robotics division. He uh, went from there to, or came from there to Silicon Valley and um, became an entrepreneur in residence at Benchmark Capital from where he started Ariba. And uh, how many of you are familiar with Ariba? Okay, it's a little, a few more than, than the last class. So um, Ariba was one of the fastest growing software companies of all time. Keith was CEO for five years, chairman of the board for seven years, and uh, stewarded their growth from zero to over $500 million in revenue. So it was a wild ride. He learned, lo learned lots of things and will be sharing with us today some of the, the key aspects of his, his approach to building a company, what worked, what didn't work, and some of the rules of thumb and best practices, and um, I guess ex stories and experiences from the trenches that came out of the Ariba experience. Um, as a side note, I actually tried to uh, detour Keith fr from the path of starting Ariba. In 96, I was actually founding another software company and I visited him at Benchmark. And said, you know, this is such a cool idea that I've got. Why don't you come be CEO of this company? And he said, you know, I think I've got some other things in the works. I've got some plans here that I think could be really big. And I said, well, I'm sure they can't be as big as what, uh, what I've got here. <laughs> uh, lo and behold, they were vastly larger than what, um, what we did, and he built a really tremendous company. So I'm very, very pleased to have him here and to uh, gain his wisdom and have him share his experience from Ariba. Everyone, please welcome Keith Croft. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy. Uh, you know, it would have been fun to build that company with you. Um, it's great to be here at Berkeley. As I told the uh, entrepreneurial marketing class, I feel like I've like lowered the IQ about 20 points being here with all you smart uh, people from Berkeley. Um, but I've got a lot of battle scars and, uh, and a lot of experiences that I'd like to share with you. Um, and we, we were talking in that class earlier about uh, in terms of building a company, the most important thing is the people side of the equation. And it's all about building a high performance team. Uh, I'm part of an advisory board for a venture capital firm in, in uh, Silicon Valley, Voyager. We were talking about that before in terms of, uh, you know, new technologies, new markets. Uh, all that stuff's important when you're building a company from scratch. But the most important thing is building a high-performance team. So that's what I'm going to talk with you about today. And I've had an opportunity to do that three times in my career. The first one um, Stacy mentioned was this uh, robotics company we built at General Motors. It was actually a joint venture, a 50-50 joint venture with a Japanese company called Fanuc. The average age of, um, of this joint venture was 28 years old. And we became the industry leader in terms of market share by a factor of three in four years. We grew that from zero to 280 million. We put General Electric out of business, IBM out of business, um, Westinghouse out of business. And it basically followed this kind of the same principles that I'm going to share with you in terms of the case study that I'm going to use, and that's Ariba. The second opportunity um, to build a high-performance team was when I first came out to Silicon Valley. That was a company called Rasna. That was in the mechanical computer-aided engineering space. Um, and over the course of seven years, we built that, and we sold that uh, company to Parametric Technologies, the same company that's Stacy sold her company to for about $500 million back in 95. So um, I've had three great experiences doing that. And, and you know, one of the things I told the other class is, is that regardless of the product, regardless of the technology, these principles are absolutely universal. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about building that high performance team. Let's see, this is a different one. Is that good? You can tell I'm a really high-tech guy. <laughs> it's not doing anything. <laughs> Let's see. I, I don't know. Maybe we can try it another way. There you go. Just hit that. OK, yeah. great. Super. So uh, you know, in terms of building a high-performance team, it looks easy on the surface, right? You find the right opportunity. You hire great people. And then you get everyone working together as a team. Right? That's easy. 
Actually, when you dig down under the covers, it's a lot tougher than almost anything. And, that, and that's why, you know, 90% of the startups in Silicon Valley don't make it past uh, the first year. And only a very few make it to a liquidity event. And it's because it's so tough to build this high performance team. So let's let's, I'm going to take a look at each one of these components in terms of the right opportunity, hire great people, get everyone working together as a team. And I'll use Ariba as, uh, as a case study. So first of all, in terms of the right opportunity, um, what is that all about? So Stacy said that I had an opportunity to spend six months as an entrepreneur in residence at Benchmark Capital, which is one of the top venture capital firms in the Valley. Um, they were a sole investor in eBay. They invested in Ariba. They invested in Red Hat. Their Benchmark One fund, uh, which we were part of because they had just started, uh, was the number one performing venture capital fund in the history of venture capital. It was a 300 for one return. So if you invested $100,000 in Benchmark One, you would have realized a $30 million gain. Okay, that's how successful it was. So while I was there, um, yeah, I was trying to figure out, out what I was going to do when I grew up after this whole RAS experience, after we just sold the company. And it's like, okay, I'm in it for sport. What am I going to do? So they said, well, why don't you be our first entrepreneur in residence? And, you know, if you want to become a venture partner, you can do that. If you want to go run one of our portfolio companies, you can do that. And by the way, if you want to go start your own company, you can do that and we'll finance you. So, at, so I looked at about 100 different deals. Some they invested in, some they hadn't. And as I, as I was doing that, I said, all right, I want to put together, you know, the key factors that would uh, increase the probability of taking something from a concept level all the way to a sustaining public company. And, uh, and that's where kind of what I call the Magnificent Seven came up with. Some of these are obvious, but I also believe sometimes it's important to state the obvious. So I'll share those with you. The first one is look for a big market because it's just as easy to build a company in a big market as it is a small market. So given the choice, go for a big market. And in this mechanical engineering space that I just come from, that was a small market. We got about as much out of it as you possibly could. But, so let's look for a big one. And if, by the way, especially in the software business, it's undergoing uh, a paradigm shift, you're at an inflection point, so much the better because the existing players will go back to ground zero. So for Ariba, the space we looked at was business to business electro electronic commerce. Over a trillion dollar market. I mean, it was going to be huge. Uh, there was no question about that. And right at that time, the internet was coming out. So all these existing software companies like Oracle, SAP, all these companies, they were all written originally in mainframe and now kind of client server technology. And so we were the first company that developed an enterprise application on the internet. And that was a tremendous advantage for us because they had old legacy baggage um, software that it, we knew that would take them two years to even catch us. The second Magnificent Seven, I call it focus, focus, focus. And that is, uh, it's all about focus. And the reason why the majority of uh, high tech companies don't survive is not because uh, they suffocate, but because um, they drown. They drown from too much opportunity. So you're in this big market, and you've got to focus on what's the strategic beachhead. I mean, what, where is the strategic high ground? So it's almost like a military analogy. You've got this big market. You've got this whole big space. Where's the key point we're going to focus? So for example, at Ariba, we said, all right, there's electronic commerce out there. How many ways can we divide it? The first way is you go, all right, there's business to consumer, then there's business to business. I said, all right, we're going to pick business to business because that's bigger. That's also our backgrounds, the, the rest of the founders and myself. We say, all right, what's the kind of the stuff you buy? Well, there's two kinds of stuff you buy, uh, businesses buy. One is in direct materials, stuff that goes in your cost of goods sold. For example, in the automotive business, it's you know, steel, tires, electronics that go in cars, and then there's everything else. The everything else is kind of the unglamorous stuff. It's furniture, it's IT equipment, it's supplies, it's um, tools, all that kind of stuff. And it just so happened at that time, it was totally unautomated. Uh, so we divided it from there. 
And then we said, all right, there's another way you can divide it. So in this commerce, there's two parties. There's the buyer and there's the supplier. So which one are we going to focus on? And that was a bet the business decision because a lot of companies at that time were trying to automate the supply side. We said, all right, we're going to bet on the buyer side. And we basically made that decision because we believed in the golden rule. And that is the guy with the gold rules. And that was probably one of the most important decisions we ever made was to focus that beachhead on the buyer side in that whole area of indirect, the unglamorous, unautomated stuff, and business to business. So that's kind of the focus, focus, focus. Third key aspect is positioning. So especially in a high-tech business, especially in the software business, it's about how you're going to position that product. And, and that is um, how, in a few words, can you describe what you're about to do? And people are going to understand that you know, in the elevator. It's the elevator pitch. And the, the simpler, the better. So for example, our positioning was, we're the agent for the purchasing agent. That's what we do. Everybody can understand that. And you know, uh, an interesting experience I had, so I'm looking at these 100 deals at Benchmark, and I remember I'm hooked up with the uh, uh, chief technical officer of Borland. He just spun out, started a new company. He's looking for a business CEO partner. And I remember I went in there, and he showed me you know, this demo, and it was like the coolest thing, and oh my God, this is great technology, and man, this market's going to be so big, oh my God, and I came out of there, I go, God, this is great. And I, and I went up to my buddy, and I go, boy, this is the opportunity, well, what do they do, they do this, blah, 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 and I'm going through this for like 15 minutes, and then at the end he goes, now, what do they do again? And it was like, I mean, you couldn't explain it in a few words. And, and by definition, what that means is that a red flag should go up and say, you know, this is going to be a really complicated market. I mean, if you can't even kind of position yourself with a few words, it's going to be tough to execute in this market. So positioning is really key. The other, um, the fourth kind of Magnificent Seven is a real business model. So back then in 95, 96, the Internet was coming out, and probably half the deals we saw at Benchmark was companies that are building a website, like, the golf website or this website or that. And it's like, we'll build the website, they will come, we'll get advertising dollars, and that's our business model. Well, if you looked at all the companies that were being developed then, uh, you know, all the advertising dollars in the world wouldn't even take care of, you know, one-tenth of those companies. And, and it's like, you know, what is your business? Well, we don't have one. We're just going to build a web. And so we said, boy, you got to have a real business model. Our business model was simple. You sell software to the global 1,000 companies, and you sell it direct, and you charge you know, between a million and $10 million for it. Uh, and that's how you make your money, and then you charge 18% maintenance every year. And that was basically uh, that business model. It wasn't like build a website, they'll come, we'll bet on the come. I mean, we knew exactly what we had to do. It actually started off at like 100,000 dollars a pop. We thought that would be big, and our first customer was AMD. Sold to them for $100,000. Then we went to Cisco, sold them, their second customer, $500,000. And then like at that point, I, I'm kind of sneaking my head in the sales guy's office. I'm saying like, jack the prices. So we go to Visa, we sell a Visa for a million. Next thing you know, we're selling the FedEx for three million. And by the way, it costs you the same amount of money to make that software and to sell that software, whether you're charging 100000 or three million. And that allowed us to be cash flow positive from our second quarter of existence. That's, and so you're able to have major equity efficiency. Execution. So with execution, you can have the greatest strategy in the world, but if you can't execute, you're going to fail every single time. And you know what? If you have a strategy that maybe is not perfect, but you're better at executing than anybody else, you're going to win every single time. And the other thing to remember is that your strategy and your execution are inter interlinked. Uh, and you can't, you, I mean, you just can't forget about that. So if your strategy is really complicated, it's like really fancy and all really complex, and well, I use all the, you know, my brain cells coming up with this, you know, 40 page strategy document, then I guarantee you're not going to be able to execute it. I mean, if you can't put it, you know, on one sheet of paper what your strategy is, you're not going to be able to execute it. But the execution is absolutely the key. I skip to the bottom one, the team. The team is the most important thing. And we always used to say the company with the best people wins. 
That's what it's all about because you're putting together kind of that all-star uh, dream team. Um, and that is and it, in every single function. And I'll never forget, it was probably our fourth, uh, or actually, it's probably our um, eighth person we hired. We had seven founders, eighth person. And our chief technical officer, Paul Haggerty, comes in my office. And Paul is probably one of the best object-oriented guys in Silicon Valley. He worked directly for Steve Jobs as VP of Engineering at Next for seven years. And he comes in and he goes, we're going to have to let this guy go. And I go, Paul, man, he's only been here two weeks. Why do we have to let him go? He's a B. I go, he's a B. He goes, yeah, we can't have B guys. I go, why? He goes, well, B guys attract C guys. <laughs> and A guys attract A plus guys. He goes, we, we've got to. We've got to let him go. I go, Paul, you know, can't we put him like in system integration or something like that or give him some tests? Goes all right, Croc. I'll go give him. I'll go give him some tests. Uh, I'll give him some tests, and and I'll come back to you in two weeks. So, Paul comes back in my office. I go, all right, Paul. So what's the story with him? He goes, good news. He's a B plus. I go, oh great. You're gonna put him like in system integration. Cool. No, I fired him. <laughs> he goes, we just have to do nothing but attract A players. So it. And by the way, that story was with the company for many, many years. So if you were a computer scientist, you were a product development software engineer, man, you got a job at Ariba, it was like you got the golden stamp of approval. So it just attracts nothing but the best. And that's, that's what uh, you know, an all-star team is all about. Now, when you have a great team like that, then you need time. You need time for these guys to you know, prove their success. And in business, time equals money. So you got to be good at raising money. And we were, I mean, we were fortunate because we had known the venture capitalists. Many of us had done it before, so we were able to raise $6 million in two days. Uh, and we did it without a business plan. We just kind of said, here's the team. Here's seven, uh, here's seven guys. And, um, and we went through this Magnificent Seven, and, and we talked about how we stacked up in each one of those. And uh, that's nice if you can get to that uh, point in your career to do that. You know, for young entrepreneurs, you got to do the business plan. You know, you got to put together the numbers. By the way, nobody believes your numbers. Um, but what it really boils down to is the people side of the equation. The people side of the equation. Okay. So that's kind of the the magnificent seven. So let's talk now about the key principles of getting everybody to work together as a team. You have the right opportunity. You're bringing in the great people. You're going to continue to ratchet those great people up. What are the key principles in building that uh, team? The first one is set a crystal clear direction. What's the vision? Where am I going? Paint that picture in everybody's mind. Make sure there's alignment to that. And it's not just the vision. It's a common set of values. It's your strategy. It's your mission, it's your objectives, it's that whole thing. And I'll show you how we did that. In essence, we kind of call that our playbook. Uh, and that's really important because you have these super smart people and they're making these day-to-day -day optimization decisions, whether they're a product development person or whether they're a salesperson out in the field. So they need something, some framework to be able to decide how they're going to spend their precious time. The second is create a safe environment. Okay, so now you have these super high potential people. You've got to create a safe environment in terms of letting these people flourish, right? And, and they will not flourish if, you know, they're stressed out about, um, you know, somebody's going to make fun of them or somebody's going to be really critical of them or, you know, they're going to get fired the next day. I mean, all that. It's kind of like relieve the pressure. Um, treat all your employees with respect. All that, and that is kind of create that safe environment. And then the third thing is you continue to raise the standard in everything that you do, in your products, your processes, your people. And as you're growing a company, you don't necessarily grow like this. It's kind of more like this, but you're continuing to raise in that standard. And if somebody can't keep up with that, then you have to discipline for not meeting the standard. Otherwise, you've automatically lowered your standard. So the key is to be able to create a safe environment, but continue to raise the standard, 
right, and discipline for not meet, meeting the standard. So then it comes into real management skill in terms of always communicating with your employees because, you know, su surprises don't work in the business environment. I mean, surprises are for birthdays and birthdays only. So you've got to always be communicating. But those are the three uh, clear principles. Clear direction, safe environment, continue to raise the standard. So I'll give you an example of setting a clear direction. This is what we used to call um, our playbook. They, we still call it our playbook at Ariba. It's the first PowerPoint presentation I ever did in my life. This is August of 96. The company, back then we called it ProcureSoft. There was a few problems with that name. We changed it to Ariba. You can see our position, the agent for the purchasing agent. Really? Crystal, crystal clear, uh, crystal clear and simple. We changed the name to Ariba because we didn't want to be tied to the kind of the procurement software area because we figured if this market didn't work, or if something, or the, or there was a competitor that was already ahead of us, then we would just change the product or we change the market we're going after because we had an all-star team. So we really believed the team came before the mar market or the product. So it almost we didn't really, we didn't even care about the technology. We knew it would be in the software side, but we could have developed anything. It just so happened we kind of hit a bullseye with this one right out of the gate. And that wasn't really by accident either. I'll talk more about that. So the playbook, what's the playbook? Well, we kind of represent it as kind of an inverted pyramid. It's our vision, our mission, our values, our team rules, our long-term goals, our strategy, all boiled down to execution. So, you know, we kind of made that visual because where the rubber really meets the road is on the execution side of the equation. So everything that you do is so that you can go out there and you can execute. We were so fanatical about that, we used to like make up our own words. Like, okay, we've got to be laser focused, we've got to execute, so we used to call laser -cution. We And we even did this, we used to have like a salute, an Ariba salute, which was laser -cution. That was it. I mean, can you imagine grown men and grown women? It's like laser cution. But I'll tell you, nobody forgot about it. And we, we were lucky we had a rah-rah VP of sales guy who's even at every talk that's laser cution. So we'd salute him. But um, that's what it really boils down to. Because then you can move faster and stronger and tougher than everybody else out on that marketplace. And they don't have to hesitate in terms of what they're going to do. So I'll walk you through these. So the vision was super simple. It was to create a great sustaining organization in the 21st century. This is back in 95. We're ready to hit the millennium. And you know what? We wanted to have a great company. Uh, and most of us had come from RASNA where we, we had sold our company. We said we wanted to, to take a company public and we wanted to carry it on to this day. And to this day, it's a billion dollar market cap company, software company out there. And Two, it owns two-thirds of the Global 1000 utilized Ariba product on every desktop. So it was simply with that vision, right? And that was never going to change. The mission, the organizational purpose, gets a little more specific. So that is to be the leader in operating resource management software for business-to-business -business electronic commerce. Okay, so the key word up there is leader. And, you know, I work with a lot of companies in terms of doing strategic planning and all that stuff. And if ever I see in their mission statement it's not about being the leader, I really question that. And especially in the software business because the difference between the number one player in a market and the number two player from a market capitalization standpoint is 10x. It's 10x. So you're going to get a, you know, 10 times more return if you're the leader versus a number two place. So it's all about being the leader. So then the question is, well, how do you become a leader? Right? We were talking about this in the marketing class, and so much of it comes down to position. So big way is to find a big unserved market and name it. So probably, I don't know, our second month of existence, we said, all right, here's this big unserved market. It's in this business-to-business -business electronic commerce. It's kind of this indirect good. Some people call it MRO. Everybody, you know, some call it miscellaneous. So we said, we're going to name it. We named it Operating Resources. That's what every company buys when they're not buying direct goods, Operating Resources. Okay? So we're going to name this industry space Operating Resource Management. 
So what we did is we found this big unserved, unserved marketplace. We named it. We were the only one there. And if you're the only one there, you're the leader. That's it. That's it. And I can't tell you how much time I spend working with companies to get to that point. If you can name that space. And by the way, when you name that, then you got to do a lot of stuff. You got to convince the customers. So one of the first things that was happening is early customers, they actually changed their, their title on their business cards from VP of procurement to VP of operating resource management. It's like, whoa, that's great. And then, you know, next thing, you know, uh, uh, SAP and Oracle scene were winning deals and all that kind of stuff. And they were like going, you know, we do operating resource management too. And that's when you know you really won. And just when they say they have it too, then you kind of change the name a little bit. So you just keep a moving target. And that's exactly what we did. We changed that later on, about four years later, to, to total spend management. And then it's like, oh, and then the guys take a couple years. Say, okay, we do that too. So you got to keep ahead of that ball game. So that's a key aspect in terms of, of uh, that position. That was our mission. Next thing is to have a common set of values. So it's like, what are we going to be as a company? And that's really important because everybody's making these day-to-day -day, um, business decisions out there. And we came up with four right out of the gate. The first one was respect. And that is we've got these PhD scientists, we have these type A sales guys, everything in between, different temperaments, talents, and convictions. And we knew we were going to be located all over the world. We're going to have multiple cultures. So it all comes down to respect. So that was one thing, one core value that we said we are. Second is integrity. People can say, you know, I don't like how you look. I don't like where you go to school. But the one thing they can never take away from you is your integrity. So whether, uh, whether it's from a personal standpoint or a corporate standpoint, that's really important. And when we were doing you know, product strategy and market positioning, we took it right to the edge. Sometimes we went over the edge. But when it comes to business ethics or when it comes to financially, how do you run your books, you never even want to go close to the edge. We, we talk about it in terms of beyond reproach. And so when all this Enron stuff hit, Back in 2001, 2002, every company's being audited. We had the absolute cleanest set of books. And it kind of comes back to those core values and how we live that. Third one is courage, because what you're about to do is not written in a book. And we do a lot of experiments um, in the field. We do prototypes in the labs. If they work, you'd augment them, you'd duplicate them. If they didn't, you didn't cut anybody's head off. But that took courage. And then the other key one is ambition. And that is set those big audacious goals. You don't become the fastest growing software company in history by setting small goals. And we, we, would, we would set them high. So for nine quarters in a row, our revenue doubled, 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 doubled. And that's by setting those big goals. OK? So that's kind of values. We came back later on, and we added two more. One was innovation, and one was speed. So for speed, what I just say, if we're, not, if we're not making mistakes, we're not moving fast enough. Because once you hit that tornado and we hit it, you've got to be moving really, really, really fast to take advantage of it. So then the question is, OK, well, I have these values. How do they manifest themselves in every day-to-day you know, -day business? And we said, all right, we have team rules. And by the way, all the original team developed this. This wasn't Keith Cross. And the first one is direct, open, and honest communication. That's really important. It's, you know, it's like. That Jack Nicholson movie, you know, it's like, you can't handle the truth. As a CEO, you got to be able to. And, and, you know, you can get into a point where you're so successful, you begin believing your own press and drinking your Kool-Aid. And you sit around and have the group smoke, and you really believe everything's perfect. You, you know, what I used to always say, and I did this at my first board of directors meeting, said, you know what? What we're going to talk about is the good, the bad, and the ugly. And by the way, we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to skip the good. We're going to talk about the bad and the ugly. Okay? That's, what you, that's what you want to know. And a, a lot of times, companies get in problems because they really believe their own press. So direct, open, and honest communication. I sure saw that at General Motors. You know, I started off on the uh, manufacturing floor, Cadillac, putting all this 
these cars out, 50% of them coming off the line were like just defective. And I'd watch how the communication would go up to the, uh, all the way up the line. You know, I would complain, the next guy would take a little less, a little less. So the next thing you know, the group vice president saying to the CEO, we have no competition. You know, it's just, so you need that open and honest communication. No idea is a dumb idea. That's really important because you have all these smart people. You want all these great ideas. And sometimes they're wacky. But, you know, wacky idea sometimes will get somebody's, you know, brain process and they'll come up with a brilliant idea. We later on came back on this team rule and we put in parentheses right after it, unless it's the CEOs. <laughs> For two reasons. One is it created a safe environment. The other is it's funner than hell to mock out the CEO. So it's cool. And I had a lot of dumb ideas, too. We had, like, new employee orientation. One of the questions they had to fill out was name uh, Keith Crock's, you know, top three dumb ideas. <laughs> there are a lot of dumb ones. Um, so, oh, there's a dumb idea. Not turn off the cell phone. Sorry about that. Um, always continue to raise the standard. I talked about that in your product, your people and your processes. Um, fourth one. We're a team first, functional specialist second. And what that means is think with your CEO hat on. So for you engineers, go put your feet in the customer's shoes. And for you sales guys, don't be making commitments, you know, we can't keep. Right? Because it's all about customer satisfaction. And by the way, the formula for customer satisfaction is really simple. There's a numerator, there's a denominator. The numerator is what we deliver. The denominator is the expectations we set with the customer. So the lower we set the expectations with the customer, the higher his customer satisfaction is going to be. Maybe seems a little counterintuitive, but if you think about it, it's absolutely right. right. The key is how do you get the business to set the expectations low. That's really the art. I mean, that's the art of selling. But the key thing here is you think as, as a team. And one of the beautiful things about this team was it was non-righteous. There were, you know, there was, nobody took religious stands on anything. It's like, what's the best thing to do for the team? The fifth one, it's my favorite one. Hire the best people, especially if they're better than us. And that's really important because the people that are good at like the early startup stage are different than the people at the high growth stage. It's different at the pre-public stage, the public stage, the mature stage. It's a totally different set. And sometimes you have, you know, really talented people who can really span the range, um, but sometimes not. So uh, that's really an important one. Uh, and I'll give you an example. It's like, okay, well, you got the team rules. You got the values. You know, how does this come into play? Well, it comes into play is what you're doing is you're building the framework for your culture. What's your culture? Well, your culture is kind of, come about by stories and history that really kind of put these things in action. And the definition of culture is what, uh, what, what do you do, what does the team do in absence of the boss, right? It kind of defines it. So anyway, I'll tell you a story about uh, uh, team rule number five. So here we are, we're as a company, about four months old. We've got about 40 people in the company. Every Friday, we would have a company meeting. And, you know, I'd say a few words. I'd pick one of the guys to say a little, you know, about an order or a demo. And then we would do a thing called a round table where you go around the room. You could say anything you want. You know, some people would say, I'm so excited. Some people would say, I'm scared. Some people would say, I'm pissed. I mean, who knew? What, and we had the receptionist. Everybody participated. <coughs> and I'll never forget one of our founders, Bobby Lint, our VP of marketing, stands up and he goes, man, this opportunity is way bigger than I ever imagined this company is going to be unbelievably successful. He goes, citing team rule number five. Hire the best people, especially if they're better than us. I think I should step aside, focus on strategic alliances, and we ought to bring, bring in a world-class VP of marketing. And I'll tell you, as he said that, you could kind of see the jaws drop, you know, in, in, in the room. It's like, oh, my God. And I'll never forget, it goes around to the next guy, this young developer guy named Guy Haskins. And he goes, Bobby, I just want to tell you something. I just came from a startup software company. It's going to go bankrupt any day now. 
if one person would have had the courage to say what you just said right now, we could have taken this thing to the moon. So then what happened is it became noble. It became noble in the company to find the guy over Tapia or to move laterally. And, and, and it would happen time and time again. And it happened again with our uh, one, another original founder, our original VP of sales, who Stacy knows. Uh, and he was a guy who, Rob DeSantis, one of the great sales leaders of all time, got up to about 20, 20 direct people in the sales force. And he was a guy who did original Visa and FedEx and Bristol Myers deals and all that. And he comes up to me and he goes, hey, Croc, you know, um, I, th I think it's time we, we bring in somebody who really can manage a much bigger sales force. I go, Rob, what are you talking about? He goes, you know, I'm more of a kind of a startup guy. Um, you know, this is just like getting too complex, too big. You know, why don't, why don't you give me an application engineer and a secretary, and I'll go over to Europe, and I'll open up Europe. I'm more kind of an entrepreneurial guy. I can't, you know, this is just getting too big for me. And I go, well, who do you think we should put in your place? And he goes, well, I think the VP of North America at SAP. I'm going, that sounds great to me. I go, okay, you can move over to Europe once you hire that guy. So what did he do? He went out and he hired the VP of North American Sales for SAP, who had thousands of people working for him. And he took us to the next level, and Rob went off and opened up Europe and did an unbelievable job there. And by the way, I gave him a $2 million quota. Within the first six months, he came back with a $10 million deal from Phillips. So he sandbagged me. So you always got to watch the sandbagging. But that, that create, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. He, he was a master at setting expectations, right? <laughs> he, he really, you know, under-promised and over-delivered. So, uh, and I was very satisfied. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it really became noble and built that culture. Find the best people. That is so huge in a company. It's unbelievable because it's amazing how, in a natural s state of human nature, how territorial people, people can become. But you can actually change behavior by, you know, reinforcing, you know, these team rules and these values. Okay. Long-term goals. We had four long-term goals. These goals are with us from here to eternity. Okay. First long-term goal, grow profitably and predictably. These three factors determine shareholder value. That's it. How fast you're growing, how profitable you are. Our surrogate for profitability was cash flow, right, because we delayed a recognition of our revenue, which allowed us to be predictable, and that predictability curve. A lot of people forget about the predictability. But to have, you know, I can't, I, we probably had 20 quarters in a, in a row, maybe more, of increasing growth quarter over quarter over quarter over quarter. That's predictable. Right? And if you can do that, then you don't get into like the gas break, gas break that really kills the efficiency of an organization. Right? It's like, oh God, we're not going to make the numbers. <laughs> Slam on the brake. You know, we've got to you know, cut back on spending. Oh God, you know, we need more customers. Invest more. To just, it's gas break, gas break. So that predictability is really key. Long-term goal number one. Long-term goal number two is focus on the customer success. And we said, we measure our success by our customer success. And we said, we're going to measure the customer success from a quantitative standpoint. And the time when we crossed the chasm and hit the tornado was when our customers would stand up in front of our prospective customers and the rest of the customers and talk about it. And I'll never forget, we had a user conference. We probably had, I don't know, 800 people there. And Fred Smith, the CEO of Federal Express, says, I just want to tell you, with the Ariba product, we put three cents per share to our bottom line this quarter. People are like going, whoa. And then we had the CIO of Motorola stand up and go, we saved $140 million last year with Ariba. And then you have a guy from Sony stand up and go, you know, we saved $100 million last year in Japan with the implementation of Ariba, and as we roll it out worldwide over the next three years, we expect to save a billion dollars at the Sony Corporation. And I'll tell you, then it's like, you know, Katie Barr, then it's you, you, you hire sales guys as fast as you can, because that's when you hit the tornado. But it's all about the customer success. Not only are they successful, but 
Can they quantify it? And are they willing to talk about it? Those are the big three. So I was telling the marketing class, that's, that's your number one job as a marketing person. It's not the advertising the brochures, but it's the customer success, because that's going to bring you all the business. The third one is we said excellence and balance in everything that we do. So we don't just want to be a technology-driven company. We just don't want to be a sales machine. We just don't want to be a financially run organization. We want to have the all-stars in all those different areas because we're putting together that all-pro team. We need great quarterbacks and great receivers and great runners, but you know what? We also need the place kicker and the lineman and, all, and the water boy and all the other positions. So that was a key fundamental long-term goal. Keep that balance. And then the fourth one was our culture. And we called it TVF, teamwork, values, and fun. And, and we had fun. I mean, it's cele celebrate those victories. It's like any excuse we had, you know, big order, finish the product. I mean, there was always an excuse for a celebration or a party. And that, with the centerpiece of that always was, was recognizing guys who've really accomplished something or recognizing somebody who's noble and, you know, stepped aside and hired in somebody over them. So though that fun was a celebration, but it was a mechanism to be able to reinforce the culture and reinforce the values and reinforce the team rules. Right. So those are our long-term goals. And by the way, every, everything that I've shown you, that's the stuff that is eternal. I mean, that's stuff that's still there at Ariba to this day, 10 years later. Now here's the thing where it changes a little bit over time. So strategy, you know, we always looked at strategy in three categories. We're going to outfocus the competition, we're going to outthink them, we're going to out-execute them. So it's like in the early days, I remember, you know, these, I'm interviewing these guys, like this, like this North American sales guy from SAP. He goes, well, how are you going to, how are you going to beat SAP? We're going to outthink them, we're going to outfocus them, we're going to out-execute them. That's how we're going to do it. So in the strategy area, though, we would change it every quarter, so we would always come up with our strategic imperative. And, you know, typically probably somewhere between five and seven strategic imperatives. What are the things we have to do this quarter in order to be successful? And we did it on a quarterly basis. You know, in some different, like in an academic institution, your strategic imperatives would probably last like two years or something like that. But in a high-tech company, it's going really fast. Uh, you got to do that on a quarterly basis. Short-term goals. Yeah, and this is an, this is an example, but th these were our first sh short-term goals. FCS by June, fir first customer ship. That's when we wanted the product done, uh, and we amazingly we had it done by May. Uh, five successful betas. You know, betas where try my software. You know, for free. I'm not charging you anything, and uh, you know, give me some feedback, and you know, maybe I can say you're a beta customer. We didn't do that. We we had five. Um, customers right out of the gate. And our marketing guys were creative. They said, well, all right, let's not do betas. Let's, let's do the corporate account program. Well, what's the corporate account program? Well, we've got 20 guys who want to be our initial customers, and we would say, we're only going to pick five. And by the way, we're going to work really close with you. And you know, you're, you're going to be able to write an application article about how much you love this product and, um, and the price that you're going to pay for the product. We're going to give you a little discount, right? Understand 100,000, 500,000, million, right? And it's going to be a partnership. And you're going to give us feedback on the product, and we're going to work really close with you. And that's what we were able to do. And that's why we were able to be so successful in terms of cash flow positive. And by the way, it's, you know, and it's most important, you know, business principle, management 101, people support what they help create. So what's kind of the ownership of me, if I'm the CIO at Cisco, and you know, you know this this startup company Ariba gives me the product for free, it's like pff, I could throw it out the door next week. Now, how about if I'm the CIO at Cisco? It's like I spent five hundred thousand dollars on this product, and I'll tell you, these guys better make it work, right? I better make it work because I put my I signed the purchase order. I'm putting my name on the bottom line, so. That, that commitment is really important. Then, you know, we talk about uh, best product, best company launch, uh, and that's all about running in stealth mode for 
uh, nine months until you have customers, and then you announce it. So the results, um, Ariba is a clear leader from a vision standpoint. We changed the rules of the ball game. I mentioned that we have two-thirds two -thirds of the global 1,000. Um, and at one point, Ariba had a market capitalization of $34 billion, which was more than General Motors. And I'll never forget um, when one board meeting our stock was going up and up and up because, you know, all this success happened, all this pre-internet bubble, and then once that happened, it just kind of turbocharged our, our stock price, right? And I remember I go to Bob Cagle, who's on the board, who also came from GM. He's on the board, this guy from Benchmark. And I go, Bob, our market cap is higher than GM. He's like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> it's like, how long do you think this is going to last? Not forever. What are we going to do? We're going to do three things. We're going to get 10 years worth of customers in three years. We're going we're gonna to buy companies with our stock. So we bought a company for $400 million, one for $800 million, one for $2.4 billion. And then we're going to put as much cash as we can in the bank because we know this is going to last. So, you know, that was one of those. And then probably a couple years later, here we are at board meeting. It's like we could see that the, the enterprise software business going down. Companies are tightened when it comes to um, purchasing software, and our pipeline was drying up, and we needed to make an adjustment. We needed to cut costs. And so I remember at this board meeting, I'm going, man, we got to make some tough decisions. So I go, we had eight board members. I go, how many, how many guys have been involved in a layoff before? Everybody raises their hand, you know, in some way, shape, or form. How many, and, and then I said, by show of fingers, how many layoffs have you been involved with, whether you got laid off or laid off people or were on the board of a company? And I think it was like total 39. 39 layoffs collectively between all eight of us. Then I said, how many times, by a show of hands, how many times did you ever come back and say, we cut too deep, we made a mistake? Not one hand went up. So I said, gentlemen, we're cutting deep. And we cut a third of our workforce, which was like, you know, probably the toughest thing business-wise I've ever had to do in my life. But it allowed us to survive, you know, to this day and keep our customers happy and all these, all the other people employed, um, but you have to sometimes make those those decisions for sure. So, um, finally, my last slide. Um, leave you with five leadership imperatives where we talk about our playbook and we talk about the teachable point of view. If I could give you a recommendation in terms of leadership in this high tech area, challenge the process. Don't be afraid. To start with a clean sheet of paper, challenge the status quo. Takes courage, but do that. Inspire a shared vision, and that is people support what they help create. That's management 101. It's important to paint that vision. Enable others to act. So when you delegate the responsibility, delegate the authority with that, and get the heck out of the way. And you'll be amazed that things will happen. Model the way. The most powerful form of leadership is leadership by example. And then finally, encourage the heart, because people can deny your logic, but they can't deny your enthusiasm, for sure, and that noble cause. So that kind of concludes my remarks. <laughs> Looks like we're out of time. <laughs> OK, but I'll be happy to take one or two questions from anybody out there. Any question at all? Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you see Ariba going in this um, three? Yeah, so what we're doing is we're, we are branching out. So I, I mentioned that we always focused on the buyer side. We've got about $800 billion worth of business running through the Ariba network, and it's hooked up with suppliers. And we really don't charge them anything for that. There's a real opportunity in terms of providing them additional value, and that being a whole—I mean, that being a whole new business for us. Yeah. And when you're talking about creating a business, what qualities are you looking at executing in the market? Is it, is it <coughs> abilities or people skills? 
Right. So that's a good question. So one of the questions, um, what are you looking for? And this got asked before. So I, I'm an engineer. I've got a formula for what we look for, and we call it a Rebians. You know, we had the salute, we had a Rebians. And, and that is your technical skills plus your business skills plus your people skills, parentheses, multiplied times drive. Drive is huge. So I'd rather have a B, 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 or excuse me, I'd rather have a, a uh, yeah, B, 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 A on drive than A, 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 B, right? So drive is huge. Yeah? You think by cutting the workforce by a third, do you create like a, is it, uh, do you not screw people that work for you just in Social Security anymore? Uh, you know what? It was amazing because I think people understood what was going on in the business and we were communicate with them all the time that, you know, here's what's kind of, you know, here's how the business look. And I don't think most people were surprised. Some were for sure. And some kind of understood, you know, you have to do it for the common good. Uh, it doesn't make the job any easier though. But in perspective, you know, they saw all these other companies cutting back too. So, you know. Yeah. One let okay, great. Join Thanks. Me in thanking Keith for